Hi, I'm Kate Elliott, and we are back for the April 2022 Narrative Worlds episode. And I'm going to skip the entire, my usual entire intro and go straight to introducing this month's fabulous guest, Martha Wells, um, who is, I had to write this down, even though I could probably reel it off, but I'm, I have anxiety, so I'm not going to. Martha, Martha, who I've known for a while. Um, is the multi award winning and internationally best selling and you cannot believe how much I love saying that um, author of Murderbot as well as my beloved Raxura series and the Chronicles of Il Ilrian. Yeah. Am I, is that, is that good enough? The pronunciation yeah. <laughs> with, I have to say one of my top three SFNF ships of all time. Um, and by that, I mean relationships um, as well as, um, other many other novels um magic the gathering star wars uh, yeah. Uh, yeah anyway lots of amazing stuff and um hello martha hi <laughs> martha's joining us with allergies yeah i have well, I have a cold and allergies so i'm gonna be coughing periodically if I make little gasping noises, that's what's going on. I'm trying to suppress it. <laughs> anyway, okay, um, we're this will be great. Um, so, Martha, you suggested the topic uh, for world building um, and craft for how to avoid the monoculture, writing cultures in isolation and contact. So, I wanted to start by making sure we're all on the same page. So, I'm gonna make you talk about what you mean when you say a monoculture in, in the context of SF and F as science fiction and fantasy. What I mean is I think it's almost more obvious when you see it on TV than it is in books um, is when the you arrive at a planet or your characters arrive at a planet or at a, a or you open in your new set in your secondary world fantasy and it seems like your the culture is maybe very well developed but it's very um um i've lost the word homo homogeneous yeah homogeneous homo <laughs> That's homo I, I like homogeneric homo we'll yeah where um it has this every there's all the cultural touchstones are well, very well known and they're all kind of the same. And um, there doesn't seem to be any outside influence. And even in, I've seen this a lot in some secondary world fantasies too, where there are other countries mentioned as rivals or antagonists or whatever, but there doesn't, and their culture may be well developed too, but there doesn't seem to be any interaction between them. There isn't that, um, give and take that we see in real world culture where you know the more contact the more clothing and food and styles and and everything begin to bleed together there's that a theory i read a while back um about the um uh the the advance of uh the mongols into europe and how their those styles, the clothing styles, actually yeah. inspired some of the European, the more the 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 really cool European headdresses from that period, and things like that. You never see any of that kind of back and forth inspiration, taking inspiration and borrowing stuff, and and cuisines forming and changing, and everything that you see in the real world. Um, I think some books are better at it than others. I think that suggesting that there's a whole world out there. Um, like Barbara Hambly, for example, um, was really good at it where she'll do um, like the market scene where the characters are going through a market. And that gives you an opportunity to mention all the different cultures and the different foods and, and goods and everything that have been transported in and the different types of people, which gives you the, you know, lets you visualize that, yeah, this is not just a little stage set with nothing behind it. This is a, an existing place in an existing world. And um, so many things now, I think it's more of a problem again on TV where um, the, the problem with Star Trek and 
Stargate Atlantis and other shows like that, Stargate, where they would come in and they would meet these people and it would seem like these were the only people there, that the, the rest of the planet might be empty. As in, it just like there, but that, that kind of monoculture feeling that feels the more you look at it, the less real it feels. And that's really kind of what I'm thinking of. You know, it's interesting because it reminds me of driving through like Iowa where you go past cornfields, 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 cornfields. And then when you get to Kansas, wheat, 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 wheat. But of course, these are all interestingly imposed large scale kind of industrial agriculture as opposed to, of course, the native prairie, the indigenous prairie that would have been there before, or the indigenous woodland that would have been there before would have been a much more complex. And I think what strikes me most about monocultures and the idea of monocultures is that no matter how much, as you said, no matter how much detail that particular culture might have, it ends up losing a layer of complexity because it's like in a bubble. And I've never been able to figure out whether the, I mean, in the case of film, as you say, it's like you've got the desert planet and the jungle planet. And yeah. that's, I don't know what, where that comes from. I don't know, I guess, if it's just un, not wanting to look outside this, this bubble or sphere that the writer is working in or not thinking to do so. I think it that, can be a combination of both. Um, there's the convenience of, especially in film, of we only have 30 seconds to establish this shot and, and give you an idea of what this place looks like. So we're going to go for something very distinctive and something that seems to give you a feel of the whole place. And so, and some people can do it absolutely masterfully and give you this impression of this, all this detail and, and, and richness and some don't and it just comes off as again a mono a monolithic monoculture with not very much you know a stage set with nothing behind it um in books i think a lot of the time i mean there's no excuse for doing it really in a book because you have all this opportunity to add detail yeah. and to talk to other characters that have been to other places and to see things that remind the character of oh yes this other place and whatever so <laughs> <coughs> I'm okay, I'm not dying. Um, so there are, um, so in that case, I think a, a lot of it is just focusing too much in on the, the culture they wanna tell the story about and not taking time to realize this place had to develop and uh, there's gotta be other, <laughs> other people on the planet somewhere and they probably developed together and, and they probably got all different ways of living and not really thinking about it in a holistic way as opposed to um, you know, what they were just worried about conveying, if that makes sense. It does make sense. And it makes me think also that it, make, it reminds me, I don't see this so much anymore, but it used to be 20, 30 years ago, and you'll remember this, where you would have the, the fantasy story set in a world where it had been the Middle Ages for, you know, 2000 years and that the culture had completely frozen, not even stagnated, but frozen. And it just doesn't work like that. Things rise and fall. Cultures become rich and complex and influential. And then they kind of start, you know, they start collapsing or they have, you know, it's sine waves or abysses yeah. where things vanish. And so in that sense, even if you have kind of a history of kings let's say um it also i think the the other threat of monoculture is that it lacks that really resonant sense of history and one of the things about this idea that there's no influences from outside is that like in our well i mean the us is the united states is is a particular set of influences because we have these layers of the indigenous cultures what happened to the indigenous cultures the waves of immigration, some of which were coerced with the slave trade and how that has affected our history. Um, others of different kinds of immigrants who came in, when they came in, how they came in. But then you get things like American barbecue, which is 
a quintessential American thing, but the word barbecue comes from the Taino word, which is from the Caribbean. But mm -hmm. a lot of people don't know that. So they just think barbecue is American, but the word isn't, isn't English. Yeah. It's a borrowed word. And there's just, I, the thing about culture and the thing about fantasy and science fiction is the possibility for richness is so phenomenal. Why would you not use it? Yeah, and uh, that always used to bother me when um, I was reading, but like uh, reading fantasy and science fiction when I was growing up in the seventies, and the feeling some some books would give you of this that this land really only um, existed in a very small space. Like you hit these mountains over there, and there's nothing past that and how weird that felt. I liked places and books that made me feel like there was just no boundaries. You know, yeah. this, 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 this world could be a Taurus that actually goes, you know, it's much bigger than a, a normal sized planet for all we know, but there's just that feeling of, of infinite space out there. And that's why I really try to get in my books. And actually it's interesting uh, comparing it to the US because, um, I did a short story called The Salt Witch about um, a barrier island off the coast where um, that's basically there's it's a it's a ghost it becomes a ghost world and there's layers of all these layers of habitation that the character is making their way through that get jumbled up and everything but uh, I was interviewed about it and, and the, someone asked me um, about the idea of being able to see layers of history and I kind of thought well, doesn't everybody see layers of history all the time? Yeah, yeah. Because I was used to living in in uh, in visiting these older cities where you can see it, uh, particularly the Galveston, the, the city, the, the 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 island. The story is based on. You see such, um, you know, it started as a Victorian beach town, and then there's just the layers. You can just sit there and go, okay, there's the. 1870s there's the 1890s there's the 50s there's the 60s there's the, you know and it's just all still there and it's right in front of you and um so many places in the united states are like that our history is still there right in front of us um so it just seems really odd that when our fiction so often is like you said the midi it's been the middle ages for 2000 years it's like it's just cut off there and it feels like it's always been the middle ages too it doesn't feel like they developed from anywhere either it just feels like they all sprang to, it's like the one the, the games they advertise for your phone where it's like the little castles spring up and you know, people you know and, and stuff like that and that's how the world feels yeah and i wonder i wonder if this particular <coughs> aspect i i have not done a, a broad ranging study but i wonder if this particular aspect is something that shows up more in american well, United States American yeah. stories, um, be, in part, of course, because just to be political briefly here, one of the things that happens in the United States, and we're seeing this currently as well, is this, this desperate desire by some to constantly bury our history, to yeah. bury the terrible yeah. things that have happened, bury the terrible foundations of what in some ways is a remarkable institution with our constitution and the way it functions and in his other ways is this horrible you know genocidal slave holding past but somehow we're supposed to pretend that didn't happen or it was just like not much yeah. and then if you get this if you for some writers i think i, I don't want to generalize I think there, I think there can be in a in the United States a sense that we don't need to look at history. You only need to look at the now, and then you get that kind of trappedness in the now. Yeah, um, that, and the sense that everything is the now. So then, now your medieval, your so-called medieval um, fantasy, frozen for two thousand years culture, can be frozen in this constant now that never changes. But of course, it's just so faults even to our own country as you say even across our own last our own lifetimes yours and my lifetimes so yeah you get the plastic bubble world or you get people telling you that you're in a plastic bubble world when you can see with your own eyes <laughs> the evidences of all these these yeah. past 
you know, these, these past genocides, these past terrible things that are just still there. Unless, yeah. In, so in some, in some ways, I think it's a matter of not wanting to see and only wanting that it, it's, I guess, can be comforting to be in that more static place. But as a writer, I think you and I would both agree that it is so much richer. The worlds yes. are so much larger when you get these layers. I want to say quickly um, to those, to the people here listening, that um, neither Martha or I will be reading the chat, as far as I know, just because we don't have, we or can't, well, I for one can't process those yeah. things. <laughs> if you have a question, please put it in the Q&A and we will um, <clears throat> take questions at the end. Um, and then I wanted to say, so having decided that we are correct about this, Martha, <laughs> um, let's maybe talk about how ways to craft, you know, like craft suggestions. How do you go about it? Like, let's say you recognize you're writing along and you're thinking, well, wait, you know, I talk about this kingdom over here and this um, other place over there, but I don't really, how do I, how do I, how do I get out of the monoculture as I'm, you know, obviously there's part of it is conceptual. You have to conceive from the beginning that you don't want yeah. to be there. Um, and part of it is like literally physically things you might do in, in the manuscript as you're writing or as you're um, creating the world. That's well, a big question. So let's go, let's go wherever. I think that um, I used to do it differently. Um, I used to, when I was coming up with, when I was world building for fantasy, is look at things like, even if I was going to be making a magical civilization, is looking at things like, um, okay, they have this kinds of metal, where do they get it? Do they have mines? Or do they import it? What does that mean? Okay, well, you have to bring it in from somewhere. How do they get their food? Do they grow all their food? Or are they bringing it in from some, you know, and, and um, looking at real historical examples um which people have this well some people have a very erroneous impression of the ancient world as if it was multiple monocultures sitting around on earth and not having any contact with each other and then the reality when i can see people being intimidated by trying to um recreate a different reality in their book because reality is is incredibly complex and we still only know very little about all the different things that sort that happen but you know finding things out like there's Japanese pottery in Scandinavian graves and things like that imply a you know yeah a wide trade network and things like that but but trying to keep those things in mind and think that okay if this is is taking like a, a realistic or a situation or blah, 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 taking a civilization out of reality like Egypt. Okay, uh, Egypt from this period, what are they doing? They're shipping a lot of grain out to the rest of the Roman world. And they're basically, yeah. you know, the breadbasket for that area because they're producing so much. What kind of things are they getting in? And you look at that history and you go, okay, this is how a place like this functions. That's what I want my place to be like. And so I take those ideas, I take the idea of, well, this country is shipping out a lot of food and then, and in return, they're getting a lot of already made goods. They're not getting, they're getting some raw materials, but they're also getting a lot of, a lot of metal work or pottery or neat things in return that are already made from these other countries. Well, what is that going to look like? And so that's kind of what you base it on. And then you add your own, you know, your fantasy touches and you don't have to keep it on your one country that's kind of your template but you can decide okay well I really want to have this from this other place so I'm going to bring that into and, and make that work and so just taking real places and studying them as templates for your invented places and that's what I used to do a lot of I did so much of that um, when I went to do the Raksura books um, I decided I was just going to go the opposite direction. I was just going to come up with stuff that was as far out as I could think of it. And basically, one of the things I did was um, um, when uh, Jade and Moon are traveling in the, in the cloud roads, and they come to uh, this city. And originally, it wasn't going to be a city, but they were just going to camp for the night. And I said, oh, that's boring. Let's, let's camp. Well, there's other people in the camp. 
well, no, it's, it's, a, it's a small town. Well, no, it's a medium-sized city. And, and I just kept pushing myself to come up with different stuff. And then I came up with the, the, the city that's on the, the kind of the giant stone platter that's turning because it's producing steam heat underneath there somewhere. And that's turning the whole thing. And, and coming up with stuff like that, that was just, you know, it's um, just as far-fetched as I could make it. And, and, and just only worrying about the character's perception of what was going on and not having to explain a lot about. And you can have a lot of fun with that too. Um, so I think it's just, it just comes down to, there's different ways you can do it. Uh, I probably recommend starting out with the template version because that's going to teach you a lot about how um, cities and uh, countries and areas at the technological level you want for your story operate. And once you get that in your head and once you learn about that, you can take that and apply it to uh, so much of the rest of your world building if you want to make stuff more far-fetched if you want to have flying floating cities and you want to have underwater cities and all that kind of stuff you still need to do research but you've already kind of got that idea in your head of how a city functions and um, like Tanith Lee used to write these greats you know where you'd be going through the desert and there'd just be this whole city and it's like and you would not worry about well where are the crops you know and a lot of times in Tanith Lee they didn't come up because you got there and it was full of you know, skeleton kind of Lee stuff, <laughs> stuff that didn't eat, except people, you know, yeah. who came down yeah. through the desert wondering what the city was about. So, you know, there's different ways you can do it, but it's like that understanding that framework is always going to help you later. And I thought, and especially if you like, if you like research, that's a fun thing to do. And, and I think a lot of times when people, especially authors say research, People think of the kind of research you would do, you know, if you were doing a thesis or a dissertation or something. And this big secret, that's absolutely not the kind of research I do. Sometimes I just pick up coffee table books and look at pretty pictures and maps and things. You know, I'm 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 putting together something that feels realistic, but um, I don't have to know everything about it. Um, and actually I did an interesting panel one time with um, Warren Spector talking about developing worlds for games of the idea of, you know, getting it out of that plastic bubble where you're not creating a bubble world, you're creating pieces of a world that your characters are going to walk out into and you wanna leave sections open to fill in later in your story yeah once, once you get through the first part of your story you don't know what's going to happen next maybe you might have to go over here might have to go over there you don't want to close off any avenues and you can develop a, a book the same way because especially now people also think tend to think of when a writer does a series that they planned it all out in advance and <laughs> <laughs> yes and i'm here to tell you some some of the most amazing yeah. moments in my books were things that I didn't know at the beginning. Yeah, there's that, that spontaneous. But I left room, right? I left room. Yeah, but you left room. That spontaneous uh, creation, but also the fact that, like for the Rex Sura series, when I wrote The Cloud Roads, right now it's, what is it, three, five novels and two novella collections with some short stories. When I wrote it, I thought that was going to be the only book. I kind of wanted to go on with it, but I didn't think I'd have a chance. And when the publisher, after two years of searching for a publisher, the publisher said, yeah, we want a second one. So then there was a second one and I wrote them both as basically standalone because when you're only selling, you know, I, I didn't want to start a story arc if I can only guarantee that I'm going to sell maybe one book at a time. So that's why it doesn't really, there's no continuing story until the last two books, which were again sold together, uh, The right. Edge of Worlds and The Harbors of the Sun. So that's why they're, they're it's basically one story broken into two. Um, so leaving space for yourself, not not blocking yourself off and, and confining your world to a bubble is, becomes more important if you, 
you know, if, if the book takes off and the publisher wants more and you need to open that world and expand it outward. You know, I, I, yeah, I completely agree. And also we don't, the process of writing, especially if you're writing a mul multiple books or a really long book, I find that the process of writing itself develops the book as you go. So there's things that on book three or on book two that I, that come into my mind that I couldn't have known at the beginning. It's like, I literally couldn't have known them. Mm -hmm. And if I had shaped a contained closed system, I would never, these amazing pathways would never have opened. Um, but not, but, but, and I want to come back to something you talked about about with the panel and with not having to know every how everything works you don't have to know every detail you don't have to know how things work you can just say that there was a steam engine but you don't have to describe unless it's part of just part of the story and and it makes sense to put it in the story sure describe how the steam engine works but you don't have to you can just say it because one of the other ways that i think to avoid the monoculture is to really use your points of view, point of view characters, because they are going to know some things and not know others. And what they know and what they don't know is part of how you reveal your world. And also part of how you can show how things are expected to them or unusual to them. And that helps create, you know, Oh, what, what's that food over there? I've never seen that before. Yeah. Um, if it's, if it works with whatever, you know, maybe they're walking down the street with someone they just met, I don't know. Um, and, and so, and also their opinions about things. And so that point of view is always going to be this incredible tool mm -hmm. because characters usually have business and I call business is, you know, they, they have to walk from one house to another, or they get in the carriage or they sit down to eat. Um, they're going to have a conversation with another character about a fraught topic, but the details you introduce and the way they approach entering, they might enter the palace of the ruler and because they're outsiders, they don't know how to behave, or they might have someone with them who doesn't know how to behave. And now all of a sudden your world is bigger and mm -hmm. you haven't like added a thing where you explain it. By the way, these people lived over here and they were from outsiders yeah. and they didn't have a king. But you you show it through these, I mean, you show it through these ways that make the story interesting, but you use your point of view as your filter. Yeah, anytime you describe something is, uh, uh, it's an opportunity to get rid of the monoculture because just uh, thinking about the, the words you use for stuff, um, the advice I gave to someone, um, I was supposed to be reading the book for a blurb, but I gave some, I gave some advice. Oh, um, oh. Well, it wasn't done yet. Oh, well, okay. Okay. It wasn't done yet. I was thinking, <laughs> Martha, I would never expect that. Yeah, no. But okay, was, all right. All right, I'm good, the, I'm good. The, the editor sent it to me and she said, it's an early draft. Okay. And I said, well, okay, then I'm just going to say this. Oh, stuff. go for it. I can tell it was an early draft. It, uh, but it, it was really good and it and it was better when it was finished but it was really good then um they used the word coffee table and I said okay now we're in grandma's living room so you know we're out of the the cool place we were and now we're in grandma's living room so let's not call it a coffee table even if they have coffee let's not call it a coffee table, call it a low table or something, just something like that. And so thinking about little details and thinking about the words you use and the impression they give people. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And also Hang I pointed there. out some of the good things they did of um, the descriptions of a dinner, which got very elaborate and, and, and it's like, I was like, all this stuff is great because, and you can even like lean into it more because this is telling you a lot about the culture, just the pickiness yeah. of the little, you know, the little bits of food and the way they do this and you have to do that and eat that. And it's confusing to the other person and everything. That's good. And so that's a good example of what you need to be looking at in the rest of the book is inserting these, these, these you have plenty of opportunity to insert these bits of culture that make it stand out, you know, make it, make it your own basically take it away from a generic 
into yeah. this is this this is this new culture yeah that idea also that all the points of view have the same view but no point of view is going to have the same view you know i have among other i have three children but i have identical twins who are essentially clones right they don't have the same view of things yeah. and why and they grew up in the same household but they don't so why would anybody have the same view because they are always going to end up having yeah. different experiences i want to come back though to the rexura because you know how much i love the rexura series starts with the cloud roads if you haven't read it by the way um but one of the great things you do there you talked about how you just like opened it up and let yourself just go bigger and almost I don't want to say like like just saw no limits for yourself but I want to also talk a little bit or ask you to talk a, a little bit about how you tied it in to ecological areas so you have the people who live up in the in in the tree but you have people who live in the above ground roots of the tree and you have people who live in different ecological areas and all these people have different ways of being and to me this was one of the most uh, this was just something i loved so much i love so much about that world is that i feel the distinctness of how these little small groups develop because of where they live yeah, a lot of that was thinking about um, just like the different parts of a rainforest. You have the different levels with different, um, um, you know, animals and birds and insect life and based on what level of light they're living in. Um, uh, one of the places we go to on vacations is a Moody Gardens, which has an actual rainforest pyramid that you can walk through exhibit oh, nice. and everything. And it's got birds and all kinds of cool stuff. And it's really neat. And it does a good job of really kind of illustrating that. And um, so the reaches really came from that is thinking, you know, because at first I'm thinking, okay, the Rex are going to come in and they're going to live in the tree. And then that was at the beginning of the cloud roads. And we get to Serpent Sea where that actually happens. And I'm really thinking a lot about what this would look like because I never expected to be able to write Serpent Sea. So I didn't expect we'd ever get there. And so now I'm coming up with this tree and then thinking, yeah, you're going to have, I, I didn't get a chance to show it, but there should, there was probably be another culture living up of, that's of like bird people living somewhere up in the top um, or insect bird people or something. But then there's the, uh, uh, later on in, uh, no, they do show up there, but the, the cack that live in the roots basically are that culture down there. And then the more they, and then the, as the series goes on, you find more and more different. There's, there's deep swamp areas, the reaches that most people are afraid to go into. And there's whole cultures that are trading with each other and have vehicles and everything. And they're living in that, that niche. But just thinking of it as taking the natural world and looking like, okay, what would this look like on a much grander scale you know you have a tree the size of a mountain how much life could that so you know look at how much life a normal tree supports how much life would a mountain-sized tree support and what would that look like when a lot of it is intelligent sentient life and the other thing i tried to do there uh, <coughs> sorry about this uh, as i went along was um they encounter um people that are clearly intelligent but it's a different form of intelligence and one of the novellas it's a tree creature that points the way for them there's a couple of times where there's it's clearly a sentient tree and then other times there's they would talk about god i can't remember what they were called they called them tree frogs or something like that where you're kind of like is this an animal or is this a person in it that there might actually be whole civilizations out there that the other civilizations you were reading about didn't interact with because they were so different there was no point these points of contact were so uh so small that you know there was not a lot of under there was understanding that this was maybe a sentient being and not an animal but that's all they felt that's all the as far as the understanding right. so trying to make the world as vast as possible basically I, there, I, there's and for, I think in general, writing, especially in what I would call the pre-industrial, but this is also the case of, of once we move into the industrial civilizations, is to think about 
where the culture is, you know, and I, I say this all the time, I always feel like I'm repeating myself, but if, if a culture has grown up in the middle of the desert, they're probably not going to have a lot of complex words about the ocean. Mm -hmm. And they're probably not going to have a complex cosmology dealing with the ocean unless some large group of them for some reason came a long distance inland and has retained that deep in their, you know, deep in the culture, which is a whole other way to look at it. Right. I mean, so you have that, but it, people develop, especially in, in pre-industrial cultures where the focus is on having enough to eat, you know, people folk develop ways to have enough to eat. Either they fish or they, you know, where are they that they can fish? Um, where they develop um, step nomads who develop tra transhumans, which is where you move, you, you move with the herds and you go to where the herds can feed. So over the winter, you have your winter pastures and in the summer, you have your summer pastures. And you see that in places like mountainous areas in Europe as well. You know, you go up in the summer to the high slopes in the Swiss Alps and down in the winter into the valley, which is more protected. Um, and what kind of soil do you have? What can you grow there? All of these things are going to affect not just what you eat, how quickly you can move. Is, are there waterways? Can you build roads? What kind of barriers are there to these things, but also how much people can interact with their neighbors and their farther neighbors. Because I wanted to come back to another comment you talk about, which is how do you, like, if, so here you are writing and you've, you've developed this kind of central culture, which is like fabulous, right? And how, what are some other ways to create points of contact between cultures? What are some of the things that you've used or that you've seen used? I'm, I have, I mean, the typical ones that I think we use are like war and the things that go along with war, um, which are often like slavery, refugees, mm -hmm. immigration, forced immigration, um, the, the revolution, which can be internal or outside agitation, but trade, curiosity, pilgrimage, travel. Um, but what, so what are some <laughs> of the ways to create interesting points of contact in a narrative. <coughs> well, uh, it's, sorry, I was trying to fill that out so you could talk. It you just kept coming. Um, one of the things that um, I tell people when I'm teaching world building is one of the points you can start with is your with your culture is how they treat strangers. Yes, um, yes, yes. In a lot of, oh, good. you see a lot of fantasy where the default seems to be to fall into um, a kind, again, that kind of middle ages or post middle ages view of Europe where you have a lot of, or our view of what it was like, which was not really yeah. what it was like. Yeah. We have a lot of cultures, different cultures fighting. So whenever people encounter uh, strangers, it's always the suspicion and, and fear and aggression. And I decided with the Raksura books at some point, I don't remember when, I was just not gonna do that that they did not have, that their world clearly shows there was war at some point because of they see so much destroyed buildings, but they don't, that's literally so far back. The Raksura at least, and a lot of the people they encounter don't have much memory of that. There's no, um, there are probably people who do know what happened and have these archives and things like that, but the most of the characters you encounter uh, don't either don't know or don't care. Um, though later on in the series, they do kind of touch on that. Uh, they start seeing a bit more shapes of what of the one at least one of the things that there was all these cultures that had a lot of conflict. But that for most of them, it's just like war is not something that happens. They're a lot more worried about natural disasters or the fell than basically uh, animal predators which is what they have to deal with a lot. So there's, you know, people who wander into your town are not considered, you know, that it's kind of rare um, to have people come in with aggression. One thing, there's so many places to live, um, you don't see, you just don't see it happening a lot. One of the novellas, um, I think it's the Dead City, um, where Moon is stopped at a, um, basically a little um, inn, um, on his trying to get away from something and these 
very aggressive um, strangers from someplace else can come in and frighten the people there. And they, and with oh the, yeah, I remember that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, it's just like, what the hell yeah. are you doing? It's like yeah. it's not something that anybody they have absolutely no idea what to do because they're just not used to that kind of thing. People just don't do that. People just don't come into other people's territory, and and yeah, do stuff like that. It just doesn't happen. Um, and then you find out why they're doing it, and they actually have a good reason. Um, but but they're still jerks. Um, so trying to kind of taking those basic assumptions about what we think a world looks like, and um, and and changing it tweaking it and actually examining it and say, well, why do I think this is the case because of this? It's like, well, is that really true? It's like, probably not. Why do we have to have this? I don't want it. Okay, well then don't do it. You know, um, with the, I have a fantasy novel coming out next year called Witch King. And I've the, read it. I'm sorry, I have to gloat for a second. It's fabulous. Anyway. Well, thank you. But one of the things I was trying to do with it is I'd been thinking off and on about um, our perception of the ancient world and that the more information we get, it seems to be is so far off from what it was actually like as to how much travel there was and uh, how much interaction between different cultures and also how much technology, finding the, you know, the, the giant Roman steam engine party boat and the things they found and, and um, what that world must have looked like and what our world would look like if that world had continued without things like colonization. Uh, how different, you know, what, what our global culture would look like if it was everyone had mixed together consensually <laughs> instead of involuntarily and with violence. Um, and basically taking, thinking about taking a world like that where it's basically, um, a world where there's not, you know, war is not uh, a given and having them be attacked by an outside force was part of it and how terrifying that would have been to just have these people come out of nowhere and attack when, you know, you've been living in um, basically peaceful trade with your neighbors for, you know, hundreds of years and then be hit by, by this. Um, taking that idea and also combining it with the idea of having um, a lot of cultures that interacted on a fairly equal basis and then having one culture end up becoming more dominant by, by virtue of being a survivor and um, and the the kind of the nexus of an alliance of all these other cultures and how right their material culture would end up in in their their traditions and the way they did things would end up influencing others and how they would be influenced in turn by other strong cultures that they were part of this alliance with. So that was kind of going on in my head while I was writing it. Um, and I hope there's I a whole level layer of conceptualization here that I wanna that I wanna kind of draw attention to, which is that when we think, I think as writers, people have the option when they conceptualize what they're gonna do is to start with start with the idea of multi-layers. Yeah. It's like starting with the idea of, I think we, we mentioned earlier of history, of the, <laughs> the idea that the Middle Ages just popped up and, and it's been that way forever, as opposed to real history. And that's one of the things I did in the Ilrian books to talk about a template um, uh, for um, the Ilrian books all through is they the starting with the element of fire and going up to the the fall of Ilrian trilogy is the way it's it's aged the country ages yeah and the culture ages and you see them going from <coughs> a semi-modified monarchy up to a more uh, democratic monarchy where they have a um, you know a council that votes and they have a ministry that that um, they have a constitution, they have all these more of these protections and how they're also their culture changes and how just the city itself that, that you spend a lot of time in um, goes from that kind of medieval city with the winding streets and everything to the more uh, labelle epic city where they've cut huge swaths for new streets and, 
and that becomes a plot point in the first chapter of Death of the Necromancer when they realize that the, the house they were breaking into, they're actually breaking into the basement of the house next door because there was another house there that got taken down for the street and they're in, in and they've kind of, they the basements have been combined and it would turn out to be a really bad idea if you were um, hiding a, a horrible uh, magical artifact. Um, Which is actually a great, great example of how to show, as you said, how to show history in a scene of action. Yeah. This doesn't have to be done as info dump. I want to quickly pause to say, if you have questions, please ask us questions. We love questions. Put them in the Q&A. And as soon as anything pops up, I'll, um, I'll ask it. Um, but yeah, so, so we don't have to do when we're talking about rich layered cultures, you don't have to say, and then this, you don't have to like info dump it. it it's just, you work it in. You think about the scenarios and the scenes and the chapters that allow you to have them break in and realize that there's another basement that, that it's attached to the house next door. Yeah. That in itself, even though it seems like a small detail seen as part of the narrative action, it still has resonance that carries through, that gives that the reader that sense that there's a real history here. Yeah, because there was gives, another house. It gives the city a sense of history. They, it's like they know what that what's happened because this happens all the time. It's like that they carved the street through. The family that owned that house was not around anymore or was not powerful enough to stop them. So that's where they put the street and it's not there anymore. And this is the thing that yeah. happened. It gives you a feeling of the history and this is why they did it. So people couldn't barricade the streets and shut the city down when they felt like it, which is what, where I got it from Paris. It's why kind of reading again, again, using the idea of using a real places as a template is reading about those real places is going to give you more ideas for your story, just for your plot points and your background and everything than trying to come up with them yourself. Well, because even when you try to come up with them yourself, you're still drawing on what you what you, you know of history or what you think you know of history yeah. and it's, the problem becomes when what for example what i think i know about history is not nearly as much as history is you know yes. so i have to i so i'm kind of drawing on a much shallower pool for myself if i don't go out and try to swim into that deep end and learn more things by by reading by you know reaching out by doing research however yeah, um, it is. I choose to do that. You have to just keep putting more stuff in if you're going to get new stuff. <laughs> yes, out. Exactly. The same stuff exactly. All yeah. Yeah. Um, we have about 10 minutes left. Oh, wow. Do you have anything? Well, you don't have any questions yet, people. Um, either, either, either they're asleep or we're brilliant. So there's no nothing in between those two. Um, I, do you have any specific things that you wanted to add? Um, not that I can really think of. Um, I think one thing that might also help is just when you're trying to develop your world is just kind of looking at places around you. Like um, when I live near Houston, which is a very international city it's a very diverse city and just driving through there and seeing, you know, um, all the different cultures, uh, the Cuban culture, South Asian culture, um, all the, the Vietnamese culture, Chinese, just all the different places, the stores and the food and, and just in all these different types of neighborhoods um, and taking that in and kind of getting it in your head as to what a real cosmopolitan city looks like can be helpful. You know, I wanna, speaking as someone, that's a great, that's a great point. And cities are such a great setting for fantasy and, and science fiction for speculative fiction. Yeah. But let's say, for example, that the setting, or at least the much of your setting is set in a fairly isolated area. I grew up in rural Oregon. So, you know, I definitely grew up in an isolated area. But, but the thing about isolated settings is stuff can, 
it can be fairly isolated, but that doesn't mean it doesn't also have its own layers of history oh, yeah. that, that people know about or don't know about. Um, and it also means that maybe there's, um, maybe the squire's wife got a piece of silk from China that she inherited from her grandmother and that she only wears on, I don't know, Christmas Eve mass service. I'm making this up as I go. Um, and it's kind of worn and shiny um, and, you know, but it's carefully packed the rest of the year. And even something as small as that or the arrival of a strange person who's never been there before, who's treated perhaps partly with suspicion, but maybe with welcome or the peddler who comes once a year bringing news from outside. And maybe the news they bring is something. These are all ways you can have a fairly isolated setting and still get that sense that it isn't a closed plastic bubble. Yeah, Andrew Norton was particularly good at that, I think, having characters oh. start out just kind of intensely isolated and, and, and gradually figuring out how complicated their world was. So Robin says, not a question, but I'll allow this one because it's a book suggestion and I'm here for a book suggestion. Um, I highly recommend an old book, The Pre-Industrial City by Gideon Schoberg published in 1960. Um, that's, that's a great, great suggestion. Um, and I haven't seen that one. Oh, one oh. thing I was going to mention about the Raxura books too, is that though they, they come across Thank as you, Robin. industrial. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Thank you, Robin. Go ahead. Oh. This ship, Raxura books, sorry. They come across as pre-industrial, but they're actually, a lot of the technology you see is actually biological. So, yes yes uh, you know and you and you can do that in fantasy <laughs> you can combine fantasy and science fiction people used to do it all the time you know Before, yeah that yeah yeah we don't have to you can use like it's that thing i i also recommend using earth cultures you know especially historical earth cultures as templates in the sense that you get a sense of how things worked and what people's needs were and what cultures did and how they interacted but we can also we don't have to like stick only with me mechanistic things using biology as a yeah driver for cultural and technological change is also great i want to here mention i just finished speaking bones which is the fourth and final book of ken Liu's dandelion dynasty series which begins with the grace of kings and he among other things he's doing a lot of things these are four really big books and they're very epic but the sig one of the significant things he's doing is he's showing the change in culture across time and in this case it's across about i'm going to say 50 years um of of a time when these this there's so much cultural change because of many reasons that you have to read and but it's such an interesting it's such an interesting choice to make so at to set in contrast to those old static 2000 year old middle ages right <laughs> to watch it change and it's completely organic both to the plot but both how he builds things uh, on things and ken is so clever that you're kind of going like oh my god he figured out how to do building essentially batteries, but in a totally different technological mode, not in ours, you know, it's amazing. Um, so that would be a recommendation I would make for that kind of watching change happen across time within one, within one series. You, you do it, you do it also with Ilrin over the. Yeah, very cool. Um, we are, we are almost done. Um, <laughs> You're almost done. I don't know. I don't know if that's it. <laughs> All right, stop now. Um, Martha, Martha, um, give us. Oh no, I'm going to put you on the spot. Give us a piece of wisdom. Oh, a piece of wisdom. Sorry, uh, that's kind of that's perhaps cruel of me, but <laughs> but I'm a writer. Um, I'd say is don't be afraid to be self-indulgent in what you write. When I first started out, for some reason, 
I'm not even sure what it was. I had a lot. I mean, I've I've got I've still got issues, but I don't have nearly as many issues as I did when uh, I was like 24 and writing my first novel, The Element of Fire. But um, don't be afraid to write to the things that you're passionate about and that you really like to see in books. Um, I guess I thought I would do it wrong if I wrote the kind of stuff I really like to read. Um, this is the kind of situations and things, but that's a lot of the fun of writing is when you kind of start out, well, if I want to tell this character story and I want to tell, you know, kind of do this. And the more you get into it, you can go, you kind of come up with stuff that's like just really fun to you. You know, the kind of, um fanfic tropes that you like there was only one bed everybody makes fun of that but isn't that fun that's like the <laughs> that's like one of the funnest romantic romantic uh uh tropes uh, you don't have to be afraid of writing those things because people like them for a reason and if there's certain things you like to do like i mean found family comes up a lot um, amnesia. People complain about amnesia all the time. I love amnesia uh, in characters. I love to read that kind of story. Um, you know, the kind of things that that um, that you like to read, that you like to see in movies and TV shows, your, your, you know, the tropey goodness. Don't be afraid to do that and to put your own spin on it and make it work for your world. Because if you're enjoying what you write, there's a good chance your reader yeah. will enjoy it too. And you don't, and I've seen people, you know, I've, I've had um, people I was working with say multiple times, things like, well, you know, I've, I'm, I really don't want to write this part, but I've got to, or I don't want to write this bit. And it's kind of like, do you really got to then? You know, it's like, is it, it's, if you're having to kind of force yourself, is it, is it inexperience and just not, um, you're not kind of right there yet with the way you write and the way you process your writing? Or is it something in your head is telling you this scene is wrong? I think listening to your gut and your, inst your own instincts with your writing is a thing you have to work toward and get more, um, and you get more experienced at it as you go. But if when you have powerful feelings of uh, boredom or reluctance about what you're writing, <laughs> I think it's, it's time to step back and reevaluate. Do I really need to do this? Am I just being, you know, pokey? I don't want to write this. Or is something in my head telling me this is not working for the story? So I guess, I guess that's my wisdom. That actually, frankly, that is not only brilliant, but um, I think it's true throughout a career that we fall into that thing where we think, well, I have to write this kind of work. I once asked, and then we've got to, oh, we've got to, I, I once asked Damon Knight, am I writing the right kind of thing? And he said to me, you write what is in you to write. And I would add with, I, I love what you said, don't be afraid to be self-indulgent when you write, you know, because that's where the joy is. And yeah. why else are we doing this, right? There's no point doing it. It's, just, it's too much trouble to do otherwise if you're not enjoying it. That's right. Well, I want to thank you, Martha, so much. I want to thank CJ, who was monitoring and, and being our tech person today. I want to thank everyone who came here to um, be part of the part of the the, the chat, the Zoom, the webinar, whatever this is. And to all of you who are watching this when it goes up on YouTube, thank you. Next month, May 15th, will be Solomon Ahmed. We're going to be talking about old wine and new bottles or old bottles and new wine or old wine. And yeah, anyway, anyway, so about re, you know, rethinking. Anyway, it's going to be great. Um, and there is, for those of you who are still here, there's a Nebula Conference writing date that follows this one. And for the rest of you, thank you so much. And I hope you enjoy all the series, which are should now all be available on YouTube. Thank you. And thank you again, Martha. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for inviting me. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it so much.